It's a great pleasure to be here and to see so many people that I have known for such a long time. It's really exciting. Um, clearly none of us has changed at all since the early 1980s. Um, when I was a junior doctor on Dickens Ward at Guy's, um, and there are a number of members of the very first family I ever met with Allports here today, which is very exciting for me, um, because I had originally intended to become a paediatrician um, until I started to meet people with Allports. And Professor Cyril Chantler, who some of you will remember, um, said to me, would you like to go and do some research for three years? Because we don't understand how Allports is inherited. And we've got two or three patients with Allports at Guy's, and uh, you could do some work. And it sounded like a very interesting opportunity. I'd always wanted to try a bit of research. Um, to cut a very long story short, the research was so fascinating that I never went back to paediatrics. I became a geneticist instead. Um, and I've continued to be interested in all ports, and even more importantly, in the families who are affected by it. And uh, Susie had asked you, I know beforehand, what you would find it helpful to learn about today. And what I'm going to try and do in about 10 minutes is answer the sort of the top few questions that came back from those responses, which seemed to be questions about why see a geneticist, why consider genetic testing, what added value can we bring when as geneticists we're not actually treating your condition, uh, but we can help you to understand it and help explain what it means for your family. Why do we consider genetic testing in all ports? Well, we've been doing genetic testing for very many years, 15 or 20 years. Some of the DNA samples that we have in our freezer um, are more than two decades old. But it's really only in the last few years, and Helen, who is here, I'm going to make you, embarrass you, Helen, and make you stand up. Um, we've been able to offer genetic testing on the NHS as a standard test because Helen does all the wonderful work in our laboratory. And in fact, we offer the genetic testing service for the whole country. So at Guy's, we have the only lab that does genetic tests. And most patients are referred to us by their nephrologists when there's already quite a high um, degree of certainty that um, people are likely to have Allport syndrome from looking at the family history, perhaps if they've had a kidney biopsy, from looking at the kidney biopsy. What we do is study the DNA and see if we can find an alteration in the gene that we believe is significant and which therefore confirms the diagnosis at a genetic level. So we can then write back to the nephrologist and say, yes, you've made absolutely the right diagnosis. That is the condition that this patient has. And of course, the nephrologist already knows how they should be treating you. What that also means is that we can embark on something that we call cascade testing. So it follows on from there that we can test other members of the family and see whether they are also affected or carriers of Allport syndrome. And we can make sure that if they are, they're also referred to nephrologists and have the right um, sort of follow-up. And occasionally that testing may also include testing somebody who's a member of the family who comes forward and says, I would like to give a kidney uh, to my nephew or my son or my daughter. Um, and instead of what we used to have to do, which was test the urine and test other things and make as good a guess as we could as to whether or not they also carry all ports. We can now, if we know the mutation in the family, we can offer a definitive test and establish with absolute certainty whether that potential donor of a kidney um, is likely also to carry an all ports alteration or not. Some people also ask for help with family planning and this is a very sensitive area because um, the decisions that individual couples will make vary widely. And as geneticists, it's never our job to tell you what to do. It's our responsibility to make sure you know what all the different options available are so that you can decide what's going to be best for you. Some people asked for a little lecture, and those of you who will find this boring are very welcome to go to sleep. Some people asked for a quick explanation of how Allports is inherited. And I thought I would explain the two commonest types of inheritance, and I left the third one off the list because autosomal dominant allports is so very rare. So I was slightly embarrassed to hear one lady this morning say, that's what she's got. So I do apologise I haven't got a family tree for that type, but we can talk about that later if we have time. So the commonest type of allports is X-linked, and this will explain about 85% of people who have allports. And what I need to remind you here is that the only difference between men and women is that women have two X chromosomes and men have one X and one Y. Now, I did once explain that in a primary school, 
And when I got letters the next day from the children to say thank you for coming to talk to them about genetics, one little boy says, by the way, my dad says you're wrong. There are a few more differences than that. <laughs> but from a geneticist's point of view, this is the only difference. And the gene for X-linked Allport syndrome is on the X chromosome. So women have two copies of that Allport gene, and men only have one copy. So if you have an alteration and you're in your one and only copy of the gene for X-linked Allport syndrome, then you will inevitably be affected by Allports. And that's what happens to men who inherit X-linked Allports. But if you're a woman and you've got an alteration in one of your two copies of that gene, and the other copy is completely normal, then you will generally be much more mildly affected. In this family here, we've got a lady at the top who's a carrier, and she's had two daughters, one's a carrier and one isn't, and she's had two sons, one is affected and the other isn't. The unaffected son won't pass it on to his children, nor would this lady here, but this lady who is a carrier, when she has a son, will have a 50-50 chance of passing it on each time she has a son, and her daughter would have had a 50-50 chance of being a carrier. When men who have X-linked allports have children, if they pass their Y chromosome on, that child will be a little boy and he will be unaffected because he'll get his X chromosome from his mother. But if a man who has X-linked allports has a daughter, he will have passed on to that daughter his X chromosome carrying an alteration in the Allport gene. So his daughter will be what we call an obligate carrier. We know she must be a carrier just from her sex. We actually don't even need to do the genetic test. So I've summarised it down the side here. In general, women with X-linked Allports are more mildly affected, although there are some exceptions that we, we do understand and can explain. You can't pass an X-link condition on from father to son, so you'll never see what we call male-to-male -male transmission. The daughters of affected males will inevitably be carriers, and one in two, or 50% of the sons of carrier females will be affected. Now, does that make sense so far? I can't see many nodding heads. <laughs> So most of the remaining 15% of cases are inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion. And this is the same sort of um, pattern of inheritance as you see in more common genetic conditions such as cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease. And in order for a child to be affected with autosomal recessive allport, both their parents must be carriers. Now, we think the carrier rate in the general population is about 1 in 100. So if you're a carrier of autosomal recessive allports, there's about a 1 in 100 chance that your partner will also be a carrier. And in these sorts of families, you tend to find that the affected individuals are all in the same generation, because although going back for many generations, there will have been people who were carriers, because mostly their partners will have not been carriers, they won't have had affected children. Boys and girls, men and women with recessive allports are affected in exactly the same way as each other. There's no sex difference with this type of inheritance. And if a couple have had one affected child, then any future children they have will have a one in four chance of being affected. And that's because there's a one in two chance that he'll pass on the altered gene and a one in two chance that she will. So each of these parents has one alteration in one copy of the gene but also a second normal copy of the gene. And so they're not really affected. I suppose the most interesting thing that's changed from a nephrology point of view is whereas we used to just focus on these children and make sure that they were getting the right sort of renal follow-up, what we've now learned is that parents who are carriers of autosomal recessive allports are a bit like women who are carriers of X-linked allports. They do tend to have a small amount of blood in their urine they may go on to develop a bit of protein in their urine. They may be at slightly increased risk of developing high blood pressure in later age. And we're now starting to be much more proactive about recommending that they ought to have a checkup once a year as well to check their blood pressure, to check and see if there's any protein in the urine, and to have a low threshold for starting 
uh, the sorts of treatments that we were talking about this morning with ACE inhibitors. So just to finish this little bit off a bit more, the carriers of autosomal recessive allports are sometimes referred to as having this condition called benign familial hematuria. Benign because it usually doesn't do very much that's very serious. Familial, it runs in the family. Hematuria, blood in the urine. And if any of those people have a kidney biopsy, the glomerular basement membrane, which Neil was pointing out this morning, instead of being thickened and rather shredded, tends to be a bit thin. And in these families, there's mutations in a different gene on a different chromosome from the families with X-linked all ports. Now, sometimes people come to the clinic and they just want information. They want to know what are the chances of their children being affected. And they want to be sure that if they do have a child who is affected, that that child gets referred to the children's kidney clinic um, at a reasonably young age so that they can start the process of annual monitoring and early treatment. And probably the most favoured option is for people to do that. So they take a chance. Um, there's nothing that any of us can do to influence um, the sex of the children that we may have or whether or not they may be affected by certain genetic conditions. But if we have information about conditions that they may be at risk of inheriting, then we can make sure they get the right sort of follow-up. Some couples want more information um, at an early stage of the pregnancy, and it is possible, if the genetic alteration is known in a family, to test the pregnancy and see whether or not it has inherited all ports. That's a major step to take because inevitably what that needs to is the need to make what is um, undoubtedly a very difficult decision about whether or not to continue with that pregnancy. A few people who would not want to consider prenatal diagnosis and termination of pregnancy, but who want to make absolutely sure that they don't pass the condition on, might consider, um, I've used a technical phrase here, I should have put it in um, English, gamete donation. The gametes are eggs and sperm. So that means achieving a pregnancy either using sperm from a sperm, don sperm donor or eggs from an egg donor in order to avoid passing on a particular genetic condition. We know that adoption is a choice that has been made by some couples in this situation. And the one that I've been asked about most frequently today, interestingly, is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This has been available for a few years now and basically involves using fertility treatment, so going through IVF, which you may know friends who've had, um, in order to obtain embryos in the laboratory <clears throat> that can be tested at a very early stage to see whether they're affected or not before an unaffected embryo is selected to be put back um, in the hope that it will implant. So this diagram shows you what is possible for prenatal diagnosis. Um, it is possible at around 16 weeks of pregnancy to have an amniocentesis and draw off some of the fluid and test um, the baby's genetic makeup. In fact, if people are concerned about um, inheriting, passing on a condition like all ports, they're more likely to go for an earlier test called Corion Villa sampling, which is done at about 12 weeks of pregnancy. Um, but as I've already said, I appreciate that that's a difficult decision for people to go through. PGD is certainly no easier. It's an even more complicated process. But the basic principle is that... Um, the woman goes through fertility treatment. We hope to obtain a number of eggs, which can all be fertilized at the same time. Each of those individual fertilized eggs is then biopsied and tested to see whether it is affected or not with all ports, so that an unaffected embryo can be selected and placed in the womb in the hope that it will implant. Just to give you some idea as to the chance of success, we tell people at the start of a cycle that the chance of the cycle being successful is one chance in three. If they get to the point that they have an unaffected embryo replaced, then the chance of that embryo implanting and leading to a successful pregnancy will be one in two. So many of you here will have already seen geneticists in your um, local genetic centre, and I'm sure a number of you will have had DNA samples 
sent to our laboratory. Perhaps if there are people here who haven't in the past had that opportunity, it might just be helpful to summarise what um, your geneticists can offer. Um, we offer genetic counselling, so we can spend a good amount of time. To appointments will typically be 40, 45 minutes long. Um, and that does just give us a bit more time than there tends to be in the hurly-burly of a medical clinic um, to discuss what having a genetic condition in your family is all about, to talk about how one um, explains things to relatives, how one can talk to children about all of this. Uh, we can help you decide whether or not you would like to embark on genetic testing. Uh, if it's appropriate, we can discuss what various options there are when it comes to planning um, a family. And we are happy to accept referrals from anybody. So you can ask your GP to refer you to us, you can ask your nephrologist to refer you to us. Um, anybody who knows you, um, you're very welcome to say to them, I think I'd like to go and see a geneticist so I can talk a bit more about the genetic condition in my family.